and welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 134. This episode is with the incredibly talented and equally nice Shannon Tyndall. Uh, he was so much fun. He was so much fun to hang out with. This was one of those shows where you just really connect with someone and then you had things you wanted to talk about, but then you got so busy just hanging out that you only got to like a portion of it. That was this one. Shannon is awesome. We, uh, we actually talked about how he's from Kentucky, which I did not know ahead of time. And now coming from a rural area and how that has uh, colored stories later on. We actually talk about how he writes his stories. How they're all like deeply personal and spending time with them and why he does that sort of thing. Um, you probably know Shannon because he created Kubo and the Two Strings. Which, if you know anything about me, you know that movie is very important to me because I named my dog Kubo. Um, so we talked about that, the whole process behind that. We talk about he, how he actually went to Cal Arts, but he didn't get in the first time. And he tells one of the most heartwarming stories I've ever heard about having your dream come true and just... Oh, he's he's such a good storyteller, even like as he's telling it to you. It makes sense. It makes sense why he's so successful. Uh, he also mentions that people have told him his superpower is making people cry. And I can confirm that because while we were talking, he was telling me these scenes from uh, Kubo that got cut out and then just the story and themes behind Kubo. And he made me cry on my own show, guys. Yeah, I guess there's a first time for everything. <laughs> so we talk about that. We talk about um, how stop motion works, which was really cool. What it was like seeing his ideas and the maquettes of Kubo uh, uh, in real time. He uh, breaks down his process. We talk about how much we love Peter Ramsey. We uh, talk about how he actually won an Emmy for Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, which is crazy. So cool. So cool. Uh, he talks about his writing process, time management, because he's doing so many things. He talks about uh, great tips for pitching a project, which I thought was really cool. Um, so we talked about that. He's got a new series that was just announced recently called Lost Ollie, which looks so good. But I'm also really nervous because this is Shannon we're talking about, and it's probably going to break my heart. Well, you know who isn't going to break your heart? Well, I was going to say Shannon, but Shannon definitely will. But Shannon's awesome. You're going to find that out right now. Without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Everyone, please enjoy the interesting podcast, episode number 134 with Shannon Tyndall. Theme song time. Today's, I just realized today's Saturday. No, it isn't. What day is it? It is Saturday. It is, yeah, it is Saturday. Oh, my God. It's, it, it's the only time I can get any time to do anything. I mean, like I said, it's still my my wife and daughter are are out. and uh, But I gotta, I'm got i turning um, uh, pages over for um, Lost Ollie, which I don't know if you said it was. It was an oh, yes. And so, but that's not the, I'm also writing and directing a movie right now that I can't talk about. So I'm doing that. I'm doing that and I'm doing the show. Right on. So, that's, yeah. Are you, are, yeah. You, are you good at time management? Uh, I am pretty good at it. Yeah, I'm pretty, I, I did uh, for the longest time. I, I just kept barking. I was like, look, you guys got to get me an assistant because. Yeah. I, because you're spending a lot of money to have me doing my own calendars and scheduling. And, and, <laughs> And and what you want me to do is the actual work. You don't want me do managing my schedule. And so, but what I do is I just get up super early in the morning. That's how I've always. That's how I'm used to juggling things. I always have. Yeah. I'm always. I always have multiple things going on. Sweet, so. sweet. I I feel like I'm the same way. I just have. I mean, obviously not the caliber, but the just amount of like. Can you? Are you good at free time? Because I'm. I'm not. I have to be doing something. All the time. Uh, yeah. I well, place. I I don't. I mean, even if I'm sitting on the couch and drawing, I, I my brain's always working. And my yeah. my mom says this. My wife says it. It's just I can't not be doing something. So I'll be reading, or I'll be like, even if like I'm not just if I'm watching something, it's usually I'm watching it with a purpose. Sure. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, I'd like to keep my brain running. I feel the same way. I, I, I'm like, if I have any free time, which I never do, probably yeah. by choice, yeah. it's one of those like, I could be doing something. Why am I not doing something? Yeah. I, don't know what it, yeah. I don't know what that is. Yeah. 
So you're you're in California. Mm -hmm. Right on, right on. Are are you from California? Uh, No, I'm from Kentucky originally. Oh, what? That's yeah, not even close. Yeah, so I'm from Kentucky, and it's why it's like when the uh, we uh, 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 when the announcement went out about Lost Ali this week, and me talking about that it's you know it's inspired by where I grew up. Like it it's 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 a fantasy set in the South, which I'm not used to seeing. Right. And and we, I have to be careful about like even though they've announced I, there, there's there's yeah. a lot of things that that I that I have to that I have to keep close. Sure. Um, but sure. it was, it was one of those things where when they first, uh, when they first brought me the book, um, and asked if I'd be interested in, in, in pitching, uh, you know, a take on it. I normally, like I do my own original stuff. I don't uh, adapt. I like to do my own stuff. And so, cool. um, you know, Kubo was an original thing, you know, inspired by a lot of things, mm-hmm. but it, it was an original story. And, uh, same thing uh, with 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 the film that I'm doing, uh, and then in the show. But I was like, well, let me read the material and see if I can find anything uh, that I can connect with to it. And I know, and I'd actually worked with Bill Joyce before on Rise what? of the Guardians when I was at uh, when I was at DreamWorks, right? And Bill would come in for our meetings, and and you know, he's um, he lives in the South, and you could sense that in the book. Um, and so, what, what kind of my my point of view on it was just like, well, hey, what if we what if we set it where I grew up? Let's just literally set it nice. there. If you guys are open to that, and and everybody was, and um, and uh, I think we're gonna, you know, I, I I can't do anything that I don't that isn't deeply personal in some way. Sure, I have to. I, it has to. You know, these things takes a long to make. Yeah, and there are a lot of work, and so to kind of keep you pushing through it. Like uh, it, you have to find some personal connection uh, with material outside of just, oh, I'm just a fan of this, or oh, I just want the credit or the title. It always has to come from a deep place for me, or I, I couldn't find the stamina uh, yeah. to, to 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 do these projects. So, um, and then we got this killer writers room together uh, with, uh, Mark Kames, who I worked with on Kubo and Joanna Sweet. Callow, who is just amazing. And Kate Gersten, also incredible. And, 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 uh, we actually finished our room. We had one week of zoom room, the nice. rest we had done in person and then COVID hit and then, and we of kind of just, dis- we, we dispersed, but we just had one last week in the zoom room before, um, uh, so, so it was good that we got a lot of in-person time there. Totally. So, yeah. That's actually a great point because things take so long to make that you mm-hmm. really, I, I can't imagine working on something that would be like a year and a half to years of your life. If you're not wholly invested, that sounds yeah. awful. Yeah. Well, and it's, well, I mean, animated films like on the short end of the time will take minimum like three years, four years to make. Ooh. So you have to really, you just have to just immerse yourself. And there's, when you're in the middle of a project, there's no time when you're not thinking about it. You're always having right. to think about it because you can't shut your brain off because it's either, um, you know, you've seen something in edit that day that, that you want to take a look at later and that you want to make some trims to, or I might want to rewrite pages after seeing the cut and saying, you know what, I need a line here, or I could cut a line or I need to change the line or just giving notes on like, I need an insert here to really make this idea clear. Um, so your brain never shuts off. I have to, it's why I have a, like, I structure my day pretty tightly. It's like, I, I get up at around five o'clock in the morning Ooh. and then, and then I uh, make some coffee and then I write for, for two hours. That's usually my, my, like my precious golden writing time. And then, nice. Um, and then the family gets up and, and then we hang out for, for, you know, maybe an hour and then I get a big walk in and then, uh, and then I'm back to it usually by eight thirty, And, um, and then I try and like block time out at night. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's when you're juggling things, it gets more challenging because when you're not doing, it's like when I'm not doing the film, I have to go back to the show, um, and yeah. do work on that. But it's like, it's a pleasure. It's not, it's not a hassle at all. Uh, other than 
just making sure that you find time, you're able to balance your life with it uh, and, and finding pockets of time where you can watch a movie with the family or you can read with the family or you can, you know, cook with the family. The cooking is kind of meditative for me. Oh, so, nice. So I'll just, you know, at the end of like a 12 hour day, I like, you know, Hey, I'll, uh, I, I'm fine cooking dinner. Cause I can just, you know, I'll put my, uh, my, either my daughter will help me or I'll put my earphones on and, and listen to a podcast or uh, an audio book or something. Uh, Cause I'm, nobody's driving anywhere now. So right. I can't yeah. listen to those <laughs> podcasts on a drive, but, uh, true. but yeah, it, it, it is, it's just like finding that balance between cause that it's, it's the blessing and it's the, the problem is like, I, I think most creative people, when they're doing the things that they love, you can become obsessed with it. And, yeah. and, and you just want to make sure that you're giving your, your brain and your body time to heal, but also, you know, paying attention to the people who, who like give you your inspiration to begin with. Sure. Uh, making, making time for, for family and friends. And so, uh, so yeah, this is a very circuitous route we've taken after you asked where I was from. But yeah, I grew up in a welcome. <laughs> uh, I, I grew I grew up in a little town, Shepherdsville, Kentucky. We're about uh, uh, 10, 15 miles outside of uh, Louisville, which is the biggest, or Louisville as we call it, mm-hmm. uh, the biggest city in Kentucky. And um, and uh, I usually go back a couple times a year. I love it. Oh, cool! I I, I've got a huge family there. Uh, I mean, like my mom has three brothers and three sisters and, oh, there you go. And because they were young when they had me, I got to know my great grandparents pretty well. And oh, dude. My, my grandparents really well and very close with all my cousins. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, but I've been in, I've been on the West coast now since 97. Wow. That's um, a while. So yeah, with between, I mean, mostly LA, but then I had two stints in Portland, one for Coraline and one for Cuba. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Dude, that's cool. It, in your brain, is Kentucky home? Yeah. I mean, I always yeah. refer to it uh, as home, but I also refer to LA as home. I, right. I, I love LA. I've come to love it. It was very intimidating to me when I first moved here just because not only did I, gr- did I grow up in a, in a pretty rural state, I grew mm-hmm. up in a, in a rural part of the state. Um, sure. so, so moving to LA, dealing with LA traffic, but what I love about LA is just the, the mix of cultures and languages. And yeah, I, I love, I love studying languages and, in different cultures and, and the food and trying different food from other places and different cultural experiences where, you know, if you love movies, man, this is the place to see a movie. You can see it at the Cinerama Dome, um, yeah. uh, at the Arclight, you can go to the Chinese, you can go to the Egyptian, you can go to the El Capitan, you can go to all these, uh, you know, Westwood Village, uh, you can go to all these beautiful old theaters and, and, and catch a movie at, at a place that actually has some history to it. And, and many times even see it on a film. I got, I, I got to see Roma, a 70 mil print of Roma uh, at, uh, was it? Yeah, it was at the Egyptian, I think. Uh, really? That, that, that uh, Quaron did a, did a week of screenings there. So you can't do that in most places. Like I couldn't see them, uh, <laughs> even large format because it was a Netflix film. So to see it in, on, to see a 70 mil print of it was pretty incredible. Yeah. And being in LA, you can just go to the locations a lot of time too. Like, oh, yeah. hey, there's the yeah. donut. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's that, you know, that is cool too. Uh, I'm a huge fan of mid-century architecture too, and LA's filled with yeah. it. So, so I can drive around and, and check out, you know, Neutra Homes or, Craig sure. Elwood or Lautner and, and all those guys. And uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I, I really have come to love this city. Um, it is my home, but Kentucky is also my home. So yeah. yeah. It's like a brain and heart kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's interesting how that works. So growing up in like a rural part, then I feel like there's not a lot of artists that come from those sort of places because it's a lot of working class sort of thing. So when, when did you start yeah, it, drawing? Yeah, it is. Well, I, I never, I don't remember a time when I didn't. Um, oh, that's cool. Like I remember, I remember uh, I was obsessed with comics when I was a kid and still am. Nice. I, I still have my first comic, which was an early Walt Simonson Thor 
it was before his his big kind of legendary run. Yeah. Um, and I still remember, have clear memories of, of looking at it when I was like four years old. That's adorable. Uh, but my grandmother was an amateur artist and she always, um, she had all the Andrew Loomis books uh, nice. downstairs and I would go through those and she had encyclopedias. And so I would just go to her house and draw and it was always encouraged. I never thought I'd be able to do it uh, for a living because sure. as you said you know a lot of the a lot of the uh you know my dad was he worked at uh dupont uh dow chemical for many nice. years uh my mom was a nurse and then my okay. dad when they found out they were closing the plant and so then he went back to school and then he actually got his nursing degree and graduated oh. magna, magna cum laude right on um uh from Respect. nursing school yeah yeah exactly my wife's but a nurse like, so heroes oh awesome yeah absolutely um and 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 so i'm just like but they always in, encouraged it uh they never and so there was a point where i actually for a moment thought i wanted to be a doctor and i was a biology major at the university of louisville wow and um that's different yeah and very different <laughs> uh and then my dad he goes you know you're doing you're doing well but you don't seem to be into this like what do you want to do and we had actually visited um disney feature animation in florida at oh, cool. disney world and uh when they had what they called the fishbowl there where you could walk past at the tour i said i want to get into film i want to get animation he says okay well show me that that's what you want to do and and uh and and you know i'll i'll, I'll support it and so I actually, I never put a portfolio together uh, ever. Mm -hmm. And I had like three months to put it in before the deadline. Wow. At Cal Arts. <laughs> and I put it together and I didn't get in. And I was pretty bummed, but my, my dad was like super, he was like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to see if we can, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. So he actually called the school and he's like, look, I know he didn't get in, but could you tell me, was it close? Or was it even like, well, we don't normally talk about it, but but yeah, it was close. He, he oh, almost cool. got in. And so then my dad uh, said, I want you to fly out there and visit the school and see it because CalArts is not cheap. And, yep. and I was going to have to save some money. And like, I don't come from a rich family. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but dad was like, you know, go out there and visit it. So I went out and I just knew as soon as I visited um, that uh, these were my people. And I still, the guys I went to school with, um, are still very close friends of mine today. Right. And, on. uh, so I went out and I was like, yeah, dad, this is the place. And so then I spent the next year working full time and saving money and putting my, my next portfolio together. And what was cool was Corny Cole, who oh. is a legendary teacher at Cal arts. And he's also credited in a lot of the, the Chuck Jones, Mm -hmm. uh, Looney Tunes, and he worked on. Uh, he did the animated the brigands in um, Thief and the Cobbler for Richard Williams. Just and just a lovely, lovely guy. Uh, he he corresponded with me when I came to visit. He says, "Hey, send me your drawings, and then wow. and then I will, I'll give you a critique, and I'll help you get your portfolio together." So he and I would correspond with each other, and he would photocopy artists that he thought I should study, and he would tape it into the letters. And he was really, really lovely that way. And, uh, and I got in, I got in that year Dude. and I'd been able to save a chunk of money to help out, um, with that first year school and, and mom and dad helped as well. And then I got, uh, the Walt Disney scholarship and a couple other scholarships. So I was able to, to, to figure it out, manage it. And, um, and then, absolutely loved it. And then it looked like second year, second year was going to be tough. Second year was going to be a struggle because I had spent all of the money I'd saved to go the of first, <laughs> the first year. And I, I'll never forget. I had to go. I went to Frank Terry, who was the head of the department at that time, who, who, who has since passed, but I is, he was, he was such a lovely man. And I said, Frank, it's like, I want to, I want to continue going here, but I, I just, I can't. And, right. and he said, well, Shannon, like you're, you're doing really well at, you know, you're, you're, you're getting really good marks. So, so he gave me a little bit more, um, scholarship money and, oh, cool. and uh, I will always remember Frank for that. Uh, Martha Baxton, who you will hear people talk about at CalArts also an amazing, very supportive person who mm -hmm. worked there for years. Um, just a really great, uh, they made it possible for me, for me to go. 
which really is what, what launched my career and allowed me to be able to do the things I'm doing now. So yeah. Yeah. A lot of love, a lot of love to my, to my, to Frank and Martha and those guys at CalArts really, really supportive. I love that. I, and that's so cool to hear like, yeah, speaking of a lot of love, there's a lot of love that like has been going around. Like you're, you got so supportive by your parents and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. Like getting to Cal. That's so cool. That's so good. I feel good yeah. just hearing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Mom and dad, you know, my mom was a little, she didn't want her baby boy moving right. to California from Kentucky there uh and it still bothers her she wishes she were closer <laughs> but uh but she was she was supportive as well yeah they were both really um they're really really great and and like my dad did all, did all the research and uh it was awesome because like he read illusional life he read uh, bob thomas's art of animation he read all these books and so a few years later i when i had done i was doing the the, the google spotlight story yeah. And we did a panel at Comic-Con and you know, the legendary Glenn King was there cause he had done duet. He was there with, uh, with Max, his son and, and, and they're both as lovely as you would ever want two people to be just, cool. just very sweet people. And, um, I, uh, I asked my dad, I'm like, Hey, do you want to, do you want to come out, um, with me to Comic-Con? Cause I had my, my little girl with me and, and my wife was shooting a commercial in New York. So, Mm-hmm. I said, uh, dad, do you want to come to Comic-Con? I'll fly you out, but you got to help me take care of Katie. And he was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'd, lo- I'd love that. So we were having lunch with Glenn and Max. What? And, and then, so my dad knows Glenn from the books and, and from his work. And it was awesome. Cause I just done a, like a round at Comic-Con, uh, with my daughter who was, I think she was two at the time. Mm-hmm. And she'd seen an aerial cosplayer. Oh, but sweet. it's so crowded she couldn't talk to her and she got really upset oh no so then we're sitting there with glenn and glenn was like hey he's talking to my daughter he's like hey what, what do you think of comic-con so far and she said i saw ariel but she didn't want to talk to me oh. and and glenn says um oh really you know i i know a thing or two about ariel and he turns the menu over and he starts drawing ariel on the what? back of the menu for katie and he says, oh my God. he goes, he says, uh, he says, here you go. And without batting an eye, my daughter just says, where are the markers? And I was like, no, 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 no <laughs> markers. And, and Glenn just goes, yes, yes. And so he, uh, he asked the server, he says, do you, you wouldn't be able to get us any markers, would you? And she found some fruit scented markers. Oh, perfect. And so my daughter colored Glenn's drawing and it's one of my favorite things that we have. So it's an aerial drawing colored by my daughter. So I said, it's their first collaboration together between Glenn and and my daughter. (laughs) And it smells like fake orange and limes. So it's could not be better. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I love, I love talking to people like and finding out when their life takes like a hard left turn. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you were going into the medical field, and then was like animation. Okay. Like, had you drawn anything? Like, how do you just make a portfolio? Like what's, what's going on? How well, do you, you don't do like, well, you don't, you don't, well, what I started to do at uh, the university of Louisville where I was going is I just started to, I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to shift, let me start to take some drawing classes here. I'd never oh. taken any formal drawing classes. I had just, you know, self-taught at that point. Wow. So I like I didn't know when I put that first port- portfolio together and it didn't get in. All I knew to do was I remember Disney when you would submit something to them, they had a whole process and they would actually send you a sample portfolio. Oh. And so I had copies of a sample portfolio and it had like Walt Stanchfield drawings in it, uh like like life drawings, sketchbook drawings. Uh, I'm trying, it had a lot of their animators, their, their sketches. I think Glenn had some, uh, some of his sketchbook drawings in it. And so it gave you enough of a guideline, but if you've never done any of that stuff before, yeah, you don't know, like I didn't keep a sketchbook. I like for a longest time, I wanted to be a comic book artist if I was going to be anything. Mm -hmm. And so like, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to put a portfolio together. It wasn't until, like I said, corny, corresponded with me and he says these are the things that we look for whenever right. you're, you're you're putting a balanced portfolio together this is what we want to see and so when i so like i had obviously failed at putting a portfolio together the first <laughs> time because i because i didn't get in 
But then the second time, what I did constantly is I was working second shift at this printing company. And so the, what I would do, and it was in, um, you know, it was a commute from where I grew up into Louisville, downtown Louisville, where I would work. Sure. And so what I, what I did every day is I would leave early and I would go to the Louisville zoo and I would draw the animals and, and then I would go into work. And then, and then at night, if I had any downtime, I would sketch people in, uh, at, at, at work, or I would do my own observational sketches from, you know, uh, you know, internet photos or whatever, sure. or videos. And then that's how I built the, the, the portfolio, but it, I, it would not have been, I would not have known what to do if Corny hadn't given me some guidance, um, <clears throat> and helped me. And what was crazy about that is it was a huge cliffhanger the second time I applied to, to CalArts because where I, where I grew up, it, it's prone to flooding. Oh no. Uh, Cause we have the salt river, uh, it is around us. And so it will flood when we have heavy rains and it flooded in the post office was not delivering mail. Oh, and no. it, like I had submitted right around the time and we had, we had the flood and, uh, and so we weren't getting the information. Like I didn't know if I'd gotten in or not cause we weren't, we weren't, weren't able to get the mail. Right. And so I'll never forget my dad called me. I was, I was working second shift at the printing company. My dad called me at work and he said, I just called Cal arts. I told them the situation that we're not able to get our mail. And is there any way that they could tell us the results over the phone? I hope I'm not getting anybody cool. into Cal arts trouble. <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah. And dad goes, you got in. And it was like, oh, like, what? I still get emotional thinking about it now. Cause yeah. You know, cause, cause my parents had pulled so hard for me to get in and, and had worked so hard. And then for my dad to, for my dad to be the one that delivered yeah. the information rather than getting it in a letter was just made it all the more special. Oh, I love that. So, so that's why, like, uh, you'll see, uh, like, th- th- like that kind of stuff because I was lucky enough to grow up in, in a family. It's not that our family doesn't have its own dysfunction. It certainly of course. does. Of course. But we're, you know, I have this close extended family and you'll see elements of that in very specific ways, uh, in Ollie. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's how I did it. It was, I took drawing classes at U of L and there, there are a couple of other classes, uh, drawing classes that I would take, but it was, it was just me hustling and getting that guidance from Corny at, at Cal arts that I was able to put a portfolio together that, that, that I, when I was able to get in. So. That's so cool. I, yeah. I, that, that reminds me, I think about like when Regina King won her Oscar a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. her, like it was one of my all time favorite speeches, but the, yeah. the, the big thing that stuck out was she says, I'm a result of people putting love into me. Yeah. And it, it seems like your story is very similar. You're like, yeah, Oh yeah. I, I nothing, nothing, nothing I would do that I'm doing now would be possible if it weren't, people that that believed in me both in kind of getting me out here and getting me to school uh in the particular case of of uh ollie uh ted biaselli who who wrote a, a lovely kind of write-up with the announcement this week uh teddy and i have known each other for a while and he had started an animation and we'd known each other and we'd always wanted to do something together and he's the one that that uh that reached out and said hey i want to know if you would consider this and it wouldn't have happened if Teddy hadn't reached out to me and, sure. and giving me, and, and, and by the way, giving me a shot at something that I wasn't, I think a lot of people know me as a designer, but I, I, I've, I've been doing a lot of writing uh, for, for a long time now. Yeah. And, but I hadn't written live action and Teddy was like, I, it doesn't matter. I think you, I think you'd be the, you'd be the right person for this. If you, if, if you can pitch on it and we like your take, um, and then, you know, with the support of Teddy and then, um, Josh Barry at 21 laps, Sean Levy at 21 laps and, and Emily Morris at 21 laps, all kind of believing in that take and really supporting me along the way. And I got to say, uh, it was funny because somebody on Twitter was, uh, they said when the announcement came out, they said, uh, we hope that Netflix doesn't mess it up <laughs> and I was, just, or doesn't meddle with it. It was something along those lines. And all I have to say to that is 
they are letting me do things in family content that is that um, that most places wouldn't and haven't let me do in the past. Like they've given me a lot of trust. Places cool. that I that I want to see family content go because yeah. look, I, I love comedy. I, I think it's a big part of family entertainment. But I think what else is a big part of 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 uh, you know which is which is a huge thematic part of what we're exploring with Ollie is just this idea of loss and how do different people deal with loss. Yeah. And so important. And it can, it can, it can, you know, uh, fester inside you and, and, mm -hmm. and, or, or it can become a hopeful thing. Yeah. And, uh, and the memories of people uh, who've gone on, which, you know, there's a big, there's a big part of Kubo as yep. well is uh, memory and how we deal with memory. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with like, uh, uh, I've talked about this in the past, but my mother-in-law had had uh, dementia and she always had challenges with her memory, which is a big inspiration for, this, for the story. Mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, my family has a history of Huntington's disease oh, uh, and it's kind of ravaged my mom's side of the family. Mm -hmm. And but to kind of see how my family treats it and they don't treat, because I think the, one of the worst parts of, of any kind of disease like that is you're aware, you know, that you're losing your memories, you know, that you are losing your ability to communicate. You're using, you're losing your ability to even stand and walk or do things for yourself. Right. And it makes it all that much harder, but our, our family, whenever we've dealt with it, it's always been a level of support and even little kids teach, teaching the little kids in the family. Don't be afraid of this person because they may be acting in a different way than what you would normally expect from people. Sure. Um, so it's, it's uh, like, yeah, the, like, yeah, we, we are only the sum of, of the, the, the folks who have, who have supported us and raised us, whether it's our immediate family, our literal family, or just friends outside of that so yeah agreed, agreed. so what you're yeah. saying is you're trying to hurt me that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i uh i they keep saying they keep saying they say my superpower is to make you cry i don't know if that's yes the case, yes but hopefully the case. hopefully it's in a it's a good hopeful way but i would say i uh i support miss king's words yeah uh, one one hundred percent 100%. She's incredible. So. Yeah. It's uh, dude, your stuff is just Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to skip ahead. Listen, Kubo and the two strings. <laughs> We're going to go back, but I have to say okay. this cuz you brought it up a bunch. I just got a dog a few months uh -huh. ago. I named uh -huh. him Kubo. Oh. I did. He's a little pug. He's my he's my boy. He's uh he just turned 5 months old. So when you say Kubo, it's so funny cuz I'm used to being like Kubo, stop it. Kubo. No. Oh, well, <laughs> you'll get a you'll get a kick out of this. I so I'll have to tell my head of story. So John Alshima, who is my head of story on Kubo and is my head of story on the new film. Mm -hmm. It was Amazing. his nickname. Kubo was his no nickname. No way. Yeah, so his his um his stepdad's surname was Kubo and John took it for a while in high school and John oh. and I went to Cal Arts together. And John, uh, some friends from high school visited and they were calling John Kubo. I'm like, dude, why are they calling Kubo? He's like, oh, that's what they called me in high school. They called me by my last name at the time, uh, Kubo. Uh. And I was like, I love that name, man. I'm going to use it in something. And he was like, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and so <laughs> then I, I created Kubo on the two strings and then I hired him. I was like, John, how, you know, we're doing Kubo on the two strings at like a, how would you like to be my head of the story? dude and uh and he was like yes i would love that so i'll tell him <laughs> yes please that, that your dog is named kubo he'll it love is. it it is i yell kubo a lot <laughs> awesome awesome <laughs> he's the best but also yeah. that dude listen so i i want to say there has been two times maybe three in my life where i've watched something where it emotionally broke me um kubo was one of those because and, and i remember the exact line too so there's a part at the end, I don't have to tell you, you wrote it, uh, when, uh, when it's all said and done and it's going to be great. And there's a part when Kubo says, you know, it was a happy ending, but it could have been happier. Yeah. And something about that, like I couldn't stop crying, which has never happened before. Like I've, yeah. I've teared up and I've had tears before, but yeah. so, something about that just resonated and it hurt really bad. So yeah. 
thanks i guess well well you can you i'll like mark hames can take the hit for that one yeah I think mark that was hames his, i think that was his i was just talking to mark this morning uh because well, uh, mark mark, mark 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 was actually one of the writers uh, i think i mentioned on all is uh, on ollie yeah but uh um, oh, no <laughs> yeah uh but uh, yeah i think he i think uh i think that was mark's so Dude, um, mark hurt me real bad Shannon. <laughs> Well, it is, it's like it's it is one of the things that I, I I I love that I've been able to do in my career is that is is I've been able to to do things that kind of skirt the mainstream, especially in animation, because animation can be very one note in kind of totally. the stories it tells, and it's one of the reasons I took Kubo to like it because having worked on Coraline and knew that they were interested in doing different kinds of stories yeah, and that we were able to take the big swings that we did on that film um, were, were great. And, th- and there's, by the way, there's stuff that, 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 you know, hit the cutting room floor after I left that I, I wish had stayed in the movie um, that would have probably broken you more. Oh, no. Uh, why, there, why, well, there why? was, well, well, there was originally, <laughs> originally when Beetle, um, when Beetle and spoiler alerts to anybody who hasn't seen the, the film, yep. yeah. <laughs> uh, but originally, uh, so the whole idea behind, and I have a thumbnail posted somewhere. I think I've even posted it online. Uh, originally Lou Romano, who was a production designer in the first Incredibles movie, who's a friend of mine, Love uh, it. he was doing some initial artwork for us. And I was on the phone with him and I just did a drawing of Hanzo's fortress, like tilting into the water. Yeah, I just I just wrote broken home on it. So literally, it's a broken Ooh. home. Ooh. And what I wanted that to represent in in the film was that um, you know part of the of Hanzo's fortress is submerged in water, and the things that are submerged in water are memories that are lost to time that we can never get back. They're just gone. But as they progressed into the fortress, there were parts of it that were newer and were above water and those those are memories and then finally when they go into kind of hanzo's personal study and the the reason that the it's the image of his family is on that screen is because that's what was most important to him and when they open those doors it's perfectly preserved it's a perfectly preserved memory because it was the most important thing to him and i wanted to have that moment right before they go and they have the battle outside where it's it's revealed that that beetle is his father yeah but what was what was cut out of it was that uh so we had this moment what what i wanted was that that whole story as big of a fantasy as it is at its core what it is for me is uh, a little boy to want a normal family what he considers to be a normal family Mm -hmm. he gets that family doesn't realize it and when he does he loses it Uh. and that's and that's 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 the story in a, in a nutshell, but, but being glad that he did have the experience of knowing. And, you know, he talks about his father, his mother told him stories about his father and he had these pictures in his head of what his father was, this great samurai, but he never, he would never have imagined his father in the form that he takes in the film as this, as this cursed beetle. Yeah. So we had a moment in the film when beetle gets knocked into the wall and when he comes back, he grabs swords from the dead samurai around him. And there's an extension to the battle where he is using his, um, his curse, his handicap of having four arms as his strength. And he's fighting the sister with all four swords. And, and so and Kubo has a moment where he's seeing his dad, not in the way that, that he imagined him, but that far exceeds the dreams that he ever had of who, that his father is a much greater hero than he ever imagined because he is, he is using, he is using the curse as his strength. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was cut from the film and it, <laughs> it like, and that, and that was one of those things that, that I, I wish it, it had, had stayed in, in the film. But, uh, but again, like tonally, nobody else would have let me make that movie. No yeah. other studio would, would have let let me make that film. And um, I would I I would love to revisit that world at some point. We'll uh, we'll we'll see if that's ever possible. But um, uh, I got a lot of ideas for it. So um, I try. I'll try not to break your heart so much. Yeah. Well, thanks, that. Shannon. All right. You may. I'm yeah. so. 
huh, I'm so glad there's no video yeah. on this. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's just, yeah. uh, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not emotional <laughs> on my own show at all. He just, <laughs> my God, Kubo just, Kubo hits. And yeah, just he gets his family and then he loses it. Ah, huh. Calm down, Brian. It's a yeah. fine. You're talking to Shannon Tindall. Pull it together, man. <laughs> it's, dude, that movie is, it's so important to me. And uh, thank you. Well, thank you. And, and thank you to the crew that, that made it because they yeah. made it better. Like they Beautiful. made it, like that's yeah. one of the coolest things about making these things is you have a certain idea of what you want in your head and you, and you, you've thought about it for a long time yep. and then you pass the baton to your team and then they elevate it and yeah. then they, they take it beyond even what you'd imagined it and they plus it in the best way. Like that's the, that's the magic for me is, is seeing that, seeing it kind of evolve. Uh, and it's, it's, and it's the thing that you intended mm-hmm. better, better. So, totally. uh, if you allow it to be, so yeah, it's my, it's my favorite part of it. I love it. I love it. And I'm, I'm a big fan of like Japanese culture as well. So you just hit all the right notes for me mm. on mm. that one. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful. I've been yeah, loving same. the maquettes that you've been sharing. Oh um, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Kent, Kent Melton, uh, Gorgeous. who is, who is not only just a genius, he's one of the loveliest people that you will ever meet. Um, and I, yeah, I remember cause I had, I've known his work since he did those first maquettes. I think Aladdin was the first official oh, Disney movie sweet. that he did maquettes for. Wow. And he was a, he was an idol of mine still is. And he, uh, I had gotten to work with him on Coraline a bit cause he did the maquettes for that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, with, with the team, he led the team cause there are other amazing sculptors that, that also did maquettes for that film. Um, but I knew that I always wanted to work with Ken and I told him on Coral, I'm like, dude, I want to work with you on something. And I remember I, uh, I pitched him Kubo outside of Helvetia Tavern oh, in Helvetia, please. Oregon. Uh, so I was already there and Ken was working on box trolls at the time. And I was like, Ken, do, do you want to have lunch? And I'm going to pitch you Kubo. And I pitched him Kubo. And at the end of it, he was wiping tears from his eyes and he's like, I'm in. I'm yeah. old. It's like I was in before, but like I'm really in now. And uh, I'm actually, Same. I'm actually, I'm looking at the sister my cat right now as we speak, oh, uh, so cool. because because uh, Kent got the the my cats back and and uh, and we we made a deal so that I could get the sister the there sister because the sister for me was like it's the action figure I always wanted and never got because it's yeah. a merger of because uh, I love Gotcha Man. Oh, sweet. And so there's Gotcha Man and then the Ben 10 Rye from Lone Wolf and Cub, the three brothers. From, Love it. I think the name of this story is The Flute of the Fallen Tiger, which is one of my favorite Lone Wolf and Cub stories. Yeah. And so I designed it basically as the toy I never got. And then we actually got to make it. And then, oh. uh, and then because of Kent, I was able to get the, the maquette. So. Oh, that's so cool. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the things about stop motion too, is like just to actually you create a character and then you're able to hold it in your hand. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a crazy feeling. So, I bet. uh, yeah, to have something tangible is pretty magical. How big are they? Like for like, uh, like how I think, tall I, is Kubo? Ku, I think Kubo is nine inches tall. Wow. I think, I think the other characters are about 12 inches tall. So they're roughly one what? six scale. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So that's roughly pretty big one six scale. So, well, they have to be a certain size so that, the animators can manipulate them but what's oh, crazy point. is then you have the thing if you have sometimes if you have a lower budget production they might have to make the scale of the puppets a little smaller because they can't afford the larger stage space to accommodate those uh, puppets on sets. proportions yeah so um it's it's a it's like all of the challenges in stop motion are crazy people, people can't even imagine like you'll have things where they actually talk about this on the uh, making of the fantastic Mr. Fox, how there's the, there's the scene where they have all the bottles filled with this amber liquid and yeah. overnight, the volume of the liquid had changed. They couldn't figure it out. It's because the barometric pressure had changed. Oh, and you've got to reshoot. You can't oh, no. cause you can't <laughs> and you don't get, when you do animation on a, if you're lucky, you'll get a, a, you'll get a block, you'll get a rehearsal, and then you'll get your final. But I can't, it's not like I'm building on top of an existing performance. You might see something in the block that you love, but right. then they have to start from scratch 
when they reanimate it and they might not be able to capture the same vibe that you got in that block. Uh And so it's, it's crazy, but, but I got to say, I don't think, I don't think stop motion animators get the love that they deserve. I totally got, agree. Like we got, you got guys like, uh, um, uh, Brad Schiff, who is head of animation on Kubo and Jason Stallman yeah. and, and Malcolm Lamont and Andy Barry and, um, and, uh, it's like, uh, uh, all of these guys are, um, are just amazing animators and they're as good as any of the hand-drawn or 2d animators um, yeah. on, on, on the shows. And uh, it's just, it's amazing when you get to work with these, these folks. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Andy, Andy was in the art department. He wasn't an animator. He's mm-hmm. also amazing. Also amazing. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the little nuances that they add. I remember Jason Stallman, he did one of the early shots of Kubo when he's picking up the paper off the floor after his mom's dream, we we find out later it's her his mother's dream. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing it and I, I like finding it cause there's nothing spontaneous about animation at all. You have to kind of create it. Although I'm sure. trying to change that in the film I'm doing right now. Oh, cool. We're, we're, we're leaning into virtual what? camera. Sweet. So like I'll get in there and scout with a VR headset or I'll scout with an iPad where we have a camera so I can actually find shots. Oh, that's cool. And have, and have it be a little bit more spontaneous. And then we might do some blocking with, with folks in mocap so that mm-hmm. we can find little quirks. But remember Jason, uh, when he had Kubo pick, picking up the paper, when he had shot his live action reference, he'd gone to grab a piece of paper. And because of the friction, it had slipped the first time. And then he had to go back and it was just a little adjustment where he had to go back and grab the second time. Mm-hmm. But he put that in the animation. I'm like, that's what people do. We yeah. don't make these perfectly choreographed movements all the time. True. And it's one of those things that, um, that you can only get if you have animators who are that thoughtful. Yeah. And, and the guys I mentioned and the whole team, frankly, where they work at that level that they can do it. And, and you get the same thing with, with really great animators across the board. But I just think because stop motion is this kind of, I think it's still seen as a niche. Um, mm-hmm. those guys don't get the love and they should because Agreed. to do what they do under the circumstances that they do it. Like I would go in, like, I remember Malcolm, cause I just posted, I think, um, one of the, the maquettes of, it's funny. She, I mean, she has a name now, but we like, when we were writing it, we just called her the, the old beggar woman that, that, that Kubo yeah. kind of talks to in the street. But, uh, I remember La, uh, Malcolm was on, uh, the village street set, which was massive. And he was under 10 K lights in the summer. Ooh. And I, you know, that dude's from England. He's not used to that heat. And I go in and he'd just be bright red and sweating. <laughs> no. like, it's cooking. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, dude. I'm so sorry. Right. Uh, but I think he wrote something like, uh, like on the Instagram post, he was like PTSD or something like that. He still remembers <laughs> having to. To, to go through that so sure he became a hot yeah. dog <laughs> oh yeah 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 i think anybody <laughs> down there who spent that much time um uh, was uh down there like you, you'd feel like and they had full fridges filled with ice water so they're constantly hydrating oh, but man. uh but yeah man it's 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 like labor intensive work yeah i bet uh, and yeah. time consuming i'm sure yeah because it's so framed by so they so you've got like the maquette, right? And you're, mm-hmm. I've seen them on the like rigs and stuff and they're moving and mm-hmm. things like that. Are they like switching out heads for expressions? Yeah. Like, so what, so, so there's two ways, there's two ways to do it. Um, so what you do is you build a design maquette. Uh, so okay. that's what Kent does. So he'll do, build, he'll build the design maquette and it's really just to see the, the drawing in three dimensions. And then you do the armature maquette. So you put the character in a T pose in the same way you would for a CG film. Mm-hmm. And so that you can actually build the armature to it, and so then you have someone else do the the uh, the actual puppet maquette. And so they do the puppet maquette, and then you cast, you build your armature off that, and you cast the skin around it from that. There are two approaches for uh, for facial animation and stop motion. One is paddles, uh, which you you see some of with the villain in Corpse Bride, where you're uh, where you're manipulating instead of replacements, you actually have an armatured face. And oh. you use little metal tools or paddles to kind of manipulate the face to get the expressions you want. Uh, some people don't like 
that method. I actually think it can be quite lovely uh, with with a with a great animator. Mm-hmm. But what what most people have done in recent years is replacements. And you know, for Nightmare Before Christmas, they would sculpt all those uh, all those heads separately, so they had a much smaller library of heads. Oh. But for something like Kubo, what we would do is when I would see when I would go through uh, approvals we would actually approve facial animation ahead of onset performance because we had to, we had to print the faces with the 3d printer weeks ahead of the actual shoot. Oh. And so what I would do is I would, I would see a play blast of the sequence in animatic form and there'd be a little window in the corner and I would see CG animation of Kubo's face. Cause we had a, a beautiful facial animation department, amazing team. Mm-hmm. And they would animate the face and they would collaborate with the onset supervising animators uh, to come up with that performance. And I would just have, I would have to approve that they would print it and then they would use those faces, uh, on the day. And like with, with each subsequent movie at Leica, they would add more and more faces to it. So, I mean, it's, st- it's replacement faces that are, I mean, it's, it's essentially, uh, it's a mix of hand and CG performance when it comes to the face. Oh. Uh, you still you still pose the eyes though you know the eyes are 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 not separate those are uh, are, are sorry are separate from that from those faces mm-hmm. and there's a seam that runs in the middle this is something that that Henry came up with on Coraline where to give you to give you more uh flexibility with the um, number of expressions you could get rather than have a, a full facial replacement you had a seam in the middle so you could swap out you could mix and match the brows with the bottom half of the face Oh, that's cool. Um, Henry at one point was actually, he was asking us, he was like, uh, do you guys, do you think it would bother the audience if I just left the seam in? Cause they digitally remove it. And we were like, ah, I think it would be cause Henry's, <laughs> Henry's all about the handmade and I love him for it. He's all right. about like, he's okay because he thinks if the story is great enough and I agree with him, nobody cares how you do it. True. And, and at a certain point you're not so distracted uh, by it. Um, I think it's a different philosophy for different directors Sure. Um, but they, they chose to digitally remove the scenes and they have done so for all of the movies after that, where they just, and they have to take out the jitter and cause there are imperfections, even when you print out the 3d faces. So um, yeah, it's mostly, I think for the Leica films, the only, the only armatured face I can think of is in Coraline is I think other father and father were paddled faces. I think, I think those oh. were, they, they, they weren't replacement faces. Sure. So, so yeah. That's cool to see yeah. those sets. It's like, especially like if you grew up with action figures and stuff like oh, that, yeah. it's gotta be a dream come true. Oh dude. It's you, you walk on, like, I remember, you know, when we were seeing the mock-ups um, and then walking onto the set the first time to see the village set or to see the leaf boat or yeah. to see, uh, to see Hanzo's fortress or like I was, I fully thought that we were going to do the, the Gasha Dokoro, that's the giant skeleton, mm-hmm. uh, the Utagawa inspired giant skeleton. I thought we were going to do that fully in CG. And when they were like, no, 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 we're going to actually build it. I was like, what are you talking about? And I remember walking out onto the set the first time where they just, they took, uh, they just took like a stand and they elevated it to 16 feet and they, they printed it out to scale the Gasha Dokoro's head and they put it on top of it and just me staring up at it. I got photos of it somewhere. What? And then they built it in sections. And so they would do like the arm in one armatured section. They did it with like uh, these crazy motion rigs that Ali, our, our rigging supervisor built like that. The rigging team is another place that doesn't get the, the love it deserves because they're just mm. like engineering geniuses. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty, it's a it's a pretty incredible process. I mean, it has its downsides, of course. Uh, uh, of course that you like we're we're I think on Kubo we were shooting fifty two units at once. Whoa! Um, and I think sometimes uh, you have to turn sequences over that to to kind of make sure that you're feeding the animation pipeline on set. You sometimes have to turn sequences over that I like I might want a little bit more time on. Mm-hmm. And, and to see how they work with the sequences surrounding it sure um but yeah it's a it's a beautiful beautiful process and walking down every day and, and seeing the new things people are building is always super exciting i so, bet yeah I bet. and I, I also i love your style of drawing 
Like it's, it's particular enough. It's like when you see like, you know, like a Gennady Tartakovsky stuff, you're like, mm-hmm. oh, that's his. And I feel the mm-hmm. same way about your stuff when I see your sketches and things like it's just so, it's, it's, it feels like calligraphy to me. You know, when I look at it, I'm like, that's just so it, cool. You know, it's, it's so funny. I think, I think when I do, because I do a lot of like the simple line drawing stuff now on Instagram, yeah. but for a lot of my career, I had to mimic the style um, of the show, but, I bet. Uh, yeah. So like we, we kind of, for Coraline, for example, we, we were looking at a lot of Ronald Searle and Dan Crawl had come on early on and was a huge influence on, on the way that that looked. Um, so there was that style. We had to kind of match that style. When um, we're working on crudes, uh, Chris Sanders has a, a very specific style. So in some instances, you would try to mimic it. And then Carter Goodrich came on at one point. So you try and mimic that. Like when you're working, it's actually one of the things I look for in designers who are working in production is not so much that they have a signature style, but they're, that they're such great designers and drafts people that they can, that they can kind of even come up with a new style that's based on things. Sure. And so you have guys like uh, Tony Ceruno, uh, who is a friend, who's an incredible designer. And he's a great mimic. I think I think he does also have his own style, but he can mimic styles really beautifully too. Mm-hmm. He worked on Spider Verse, oh, um, and uh, he did uh, early work on this new film I'm doing too. Uh, Joe Mosier has a very distinct, uh, very distinct style, mm-hmm. very inspired by 50s, 60s graphics, but he can also mimic other things uh, if he needs to. Um, so there's that, and so it's funny because I don't. I can't look at my I can't look at my work subjectively and, and say that it's distinct in any way. I just draw what I draw and what I, I bet. And, and what I like to draw. And then, you know, I still like to play with things. Like I did a, you know, I did like a Searle style Doctor Strange a few months ago because I, I just yeah. love Ronald Searle and I was like, oh let me let me do that. And with digital, like I don't have to I do almost everything in Procreate now. I I rarely oh, cool. Yeah, I think I, I, if I've got my laptop for writing and my iPad Pro for drawing, and then I can go anywhere. I'm super mo- mobile. So smart. Uh, but yeah, thank you, thank you so much for the compliments. I, I just uh, I still love to draw. That's the thing. I always it's meditative for me. Mm-hmm. So even if I get super busy, I warned the artists on the film. I said uh, I normally board a chunk on every film that I work on. Cool. And uh, like for like Kubo, I boarded, I think it probably amounts to like the first six minutes of the movie. Wow. Um, and then I touch other parts of it. Uh, I, I've been able, because I've been doing so much, so much writing on this film, I've, I've not been able to do as much um, boarding as I like, but I've already warned the board artist. I'm like, hey, you might see my drawings pop up in your sequences just because I'm getting the itch. <laughs> I, got, I, and, I just have to, man. I just have to. <laughs> well, and it's, and it's a much, it's a, it's a, it's a very quick way to communicate. And what was funny sure. is when I was in the writer's room for uh, Ollie and the other writers were, they're not artists, uh, not, not visual artists. Right. And we'd be in the room. And what I'm used to is like in a story room, you're putting up index cards that you're writing on, but you're also throwing up drawings. Right. And so there, there'd be times in the writer's room where we're trying to get to a very specific idea and I would just draw it. And I'm like, Oh, here, this is what I'm thinking. And it's just so normal for me to do that. Sure. And, and to see the reaction from writers, like, oh my God, man. Yeah, drawing, you can get to things that are more difficult, especially when you're confined by an index card where you're trying totally. to you're trying to abbreviate an idea. And a lot of times it's just easier with just even stick figures to suggest the idea than it is to try and because one of the toughest things in writing is to write less, is to edit. Because yeah. <laughs> you always write too much and then you bring it back. Yeah. With a drawing, you can just go boom, boom, boom. This is what I mean. Right. And I, I, that's been the, the challenge of working with Zoom lately is normally I'm very kind of hands-on. And I'll just say, hey, do you mind if I draw? And so I'll just add a layer, a layer to their Photoshop file and I'll just do a quick draw of them. Like, this is what I mean. Oh, instead of going okay. like, instead of going like, and this is what most directors and animation do as well instead of just going oh hey uh let me yeah okay maybe move his arm up three degrees and like put, no just give me a pencil i know yeah. gindy's <laughs> like gindy's Gin, gindy is constantly drawing i think it's why his films have such a particular style to him is because and yep. he's 
what Indy, uh, what Legendi is great at. He's a great animator. He's a great, he's great at timing. He's got a really great oh, sense yeah. of timing. Agreed. And you can see it. In, you can see it whether it's comedy. You can see it whether it's action. Like he's just brilliant at that. Um, uh, yeah, I lo- I love me some Gendy Tartakovsky. Same, same. You got to work uh, with him. That's pretty cool. Yeah, a, a, a teeny bit. We did uh, we did an episode of uh, Samurai Jack. I did that yeah. freelance, and then I did at the same time I was doing that. I did an episode of Dexter's Lab. Oh, at that, sweet. Th- at that point, Gendy, there was another showrunner on it because Gendy was focused on Samurai Jack, but um, he had I put my portfolio in. It was at the tail end of working on Curious George. And he'd seen nice. it. And I think in particular what he, he responded to, funny enough, was I'd done a samurai design in there and I did a gotcha man design. And, oh, and, perfect. And, and Gendy's a huge fan of gotcha man. Yeah. And uh, and I think he responded to that. I don't know if he remembers that, but I think that's what he responded <laughs> to. So, so it was only briefly. And then when we were at Sony together, uh, when I, I had a film there a couple years ago, but Gendy sure. was doing uh, Hotel 3 uh, when I was there. So it was awesome to be able to... Yeah, when I was at Sony, Gendy was doing Hotel 3. And Peter and Bob and and Rodney were... And Chris Phil were doing Spidey. Sweet. That was that was amazing to be able to, to, to be around that. And that's where... It's funny because I worked on Rise of the Guardians, but not, yeah. when, not when Peter was on it. Oh. There, was a, there was another director on it. So I didn't get to know Peter at DreamWorks, even though we worked there for several years. The first time I met Peter was uh, after he'd finished Rise of the Guardians. He came out to visit Leica when I was in development on Kubo. Oh, and I sweet. heard he was coming. I'm like, hey, can I get some time to talk to him today? Because I'd heard nothing but good things about Peter. Yeah. And I was like, I want to meet him. And we just hit it off immediately. And then as soon as I moved back to LA, we started hanging out. So um, he was my first choice to, to direct um ollie oh, there was smart. a mo there was a moment where we were going to split the episodes mm-hmm. and i was going to direct a couple but uh, because i have this whole film i'm doing too it just made it impossible but i could not be happier that that peter's aboard he's um he's not just he, he's a very humble guy and and he'll hate this but he is brilliant. <laughs> he is he is he is truly brilliant like I, like I tell him this, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he quite believes me. So I had copies of his, so he came from live action. He did storyboards in live action. Right. And he boarded Coppola's Dracula. What? Um, and I, yeah. And I had copies of his boards at Cal Arts. They're beautiful. Oh, and, so cool. and, and so I was a fan of Peter's before I ever met him. And yeah. he's, wor- he's worked with Fincher. He's worked with Spielberg. He's worked with, uh, you know, again, Coppola. Um, and he's got those chops and, and then, but he's also just a lovely guy and he's very yeah. thoughtful about everything. And so when they're like, Hey, who, who would you possibly want to, 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 to work with and have direct these like, Peter Ramsey done. Like, that's it. That's who I want. And that's like, let, let's get him. So I am ecstatic that he is on board and, and us finally getting to work together for the first time, which we haven't been able to do yeah uh is just making it all it's just making the show that much better so i love that i love when good people come together and like make good stuff it's so cool yeah. he seems like the nicest dude you as well he is he I is he genuinely is That's uh, so cool. and he's and he seemed like i would see him in what i knew was like the most stressful times on sure. on um spider-verse and I don't, I don't think, I don't think they would mind me sharing this because, because they won all the awards. So yeah, <laughs> uh, I remember, uh, uh, Chris and Phil, they had a bunch of people, uh, like friends and family to come and watch a screening of Spider-Verse about six months out. Oh, and, and to just to get our thoughts, get our notes. Sure. And it was, it was a crazy gathering of talent in that room. And I remember coming out of the screening and I see Peter and he was like, what'd you think? And I said, I don't know how you're going to finish it, man. Like you got six months. <laughs> and at that point, at that point, act three was post-its. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm right. not exaggerating. It was like, it was like post-it thumbnail storyboards. And, wow. and like, you can see the movie in it. 
Mm-hmm. But I was just like, I just don't. He's like, yeah, I know. And then I'll never forget uh, two weeks before the official premiere, I got an, invited to uh, to um, a screening through the Academy uh, to see it. And uh, there's going to be a reception afterwards with, with, uh, uh, with, you know, Kristen Phil and, and Bob and Peter and, and Rodney and, 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 and I was looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. So I take my daughter to see it. And I remember just like, I mean, well, I'll tell you how much I love the movie. I just watched it again today. And my daughter, that was after my daughter wanted, having like, she watched it two days ago. So, <laughs> so it's a favorite in this house. Rightfully uh, at, so. At, at all, at all levels. And, um, and so, uh, what, uh, I remember coming out of it. I'm like, Oh, Oh my God, this is like groundbreaking. This yeah. is unbelievable. And so I walk up to, to, to Peter and Chris and they're just exhausted because they're in the final throes of, <laughs> of sure. and, you, and, and you have that tr- transition where you're, you're in the final throes of making the movie, but then you're about to go on this big, crazy press tour, which takes oh, yeah. the energy out of you. And Chris and Peter are standing like, what'd you think? And I'm like, pioneering, groundbreaking, unbelievable. And my daughter's grinning ear to ear because she just yeah. loves it. And they, and they were both like, uh, is it? Like, we can't tell anymore. <laughs> we can't, we really can't tell anymore. And I'm like, guys, seriously? Like, just straight up? It's, sure. it, it, it's not just the best animated film of the year. It's one of the best films this year. Agreed. And so I was super excited. And, 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 and what makes me even happier is not, not, not like, not as just Peter, an amazing guy, Chris, Phil, Bob Persichetti, yeah. Rodney, they're all just lovely folks. That's so cool. And, and it's, and like, you can see the love in the film and they were under crazy, like it was just, Cause they didn't, it ain't a two, it ain't a $200 million Disney budget or a Pixar budget that they had sure. to work with. I don't think a lot of people know that Like, they're working at way less than, than what Disney spends on a film or DreamWorks. Right. And so, yeah, it, uh, they just work smart. Um, so yeah, really, really awesome. I love that movie. I love those people. It's so good. I love, I love animators. I really do. I like people that are in the back. Cause they, I find that they're all so like, we have a mutual friend, uh, Hal Hickel. Oh yeah. I, I love, love that guy. He's the best. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I find that that's a thread with people that like yeah. work in the backgrounds and stuff. It's like that you're making some of the best art of our time. And you're also just really cool. And it's so nice to hear. Cause you don't want to, you know, hear the other side of it. We're like, actually they're pretty awful. You're like, oh, no, yeah. everyone's been so cool. No, it's what, it's what, um, uh, so my father-in-law actually, his first gig was on Jungle Book. He was oh. a cleanup, he was a cleanup assistant and he, then he was a commercial director in animation and a timing director in animation. Dude. And, and it's what, um, it's what, you know, my wife says, cause she grew up around animation people. She's like, they're the best. They're just, yeah. there's no pretense, um, they they're they're we're usually pretty chill um we we actually tend to be a little bit i think i think a lot of people think that i am an extrovert i am not at all yeah i Um, i I don't mind i don't mind talking to people like i I, but i prefer smaller groups of folks same um but um and my father-in-law dave brain he by the way he's one of the loveliest uh just a just a very very kind genuinely thoughtful guy and he'd come up through it, but it, yeah, it is true. It's, it's, I love, I love the people in animation and Hal's one of those guys where uh, we met for the first time at a view conference in Italy. Oh, cool. And, um, and then we've gotten to hang, we hung out in Malta. And then when he was, when he was working on uh, Mandalorian season one, he mm-hmm. was flying into LA to do it for the shoots every week. Yep. And when he wasn't totally exhausted out of his mind, we, we would get to, to, to grab dinners and oh, cool. uh, we just had a, we just had a virtual drink uh, uh, with, uh, with Hal just to do a little catch up. I want to do a little bit more of that um, there you go. a couple of weeks ago, but yeah. And, and what I love about Hal, uh, Hal is such a, um, he's like a historian for, yeah. for special effects and, yes. and stop motion animation and, 
And I love to hear him speak in depth on old cameras and old Same. stop-mo techniques and, mm-hmm. and like all that stuff is just, um, I, I love any, any, again, he is, like you said, it's, 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 it's good when you learn that your heroes are actually good people. Agreed. And I'm super happy for him um, for, you know, all the kudos he's getting from Mandalorian. Yeah. And, he's half and, an EGOT now. And by, <laughs> I know. And uh, yeah, I tease him about it. I was like, now you got to just write, you just got to write a Tony award winning song. That's it. And a Grammy award winning song. Maybe just You're halfway write, there. <laughs> write a, write a song or produce a Broadway show that becomes a, movie and yeah. then you can so easy <laughs> yeah so uh he uh we're actually i think they mentioned it in in the article too it's i i'm sorry i keep going back to ollie but it's, it's that's okay it's the one thing i can talk about now a little bit and yeah I think i'm it, so excited so, so the the team that uh at ilm uh, London, who like uh, like Hayden Jones, who was just one of the part of the team that won the Emmy with Hal for it. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's our guy on Ollie. So, oh yes, and Steph Drury, who also worked on that, and and Christine Lemon, uh, they're there. So we have those folks on Ollie, and I cannot wait for people to see the work that they're doing in the show because it is is crazy yeah um but i like i i yeah so i feel very lucky to be working with those with those guys um i think we probably would have i would have dragged hal onto it had he not been you know such a a crucial part of mandalorian yeah uh, yeah and now i think you know as they approach god man we just got a couple weeks before the new season day i know i'm so excited yeah yeah so excited pretty, yeah i'm pretty pumped I gotta, I, I gotta not buy that Hasbro <laughs> Pulse Razor Crest. That's three feet long. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm like, but I kind of need it. But I yeah, don't. I know, but I, I kind of do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same way. I just don't have room for it. I have to put it in my office that I can't go into. Yeah, <laughs> at the studio. So yeah. Yeah, we'll find a place for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you guys have a lot of over overlap because he also went to Cal Arts and he worked at Leica. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Well, he worked. He worked at Benton. What became like a yeah, yeah. what became like a yeah yeah with the raisins. So, <laughs> yes, I know. Hey, it was one of the, when I was in Coraline, there's a room at the old Venton building, and you go into that room, and if you're an animation nerd, you flip out. Really? Because they had uh they had the airship from the Mark Twain special. They what? Did. They had the raisins, they had the noid. Dude. Um, it was all the clay puppets. It was all the the plasticine puppets from all of the Benton stuff. Is it, it was in a it was in a closet. Um, what? I mean, it wasn't. I, you say clo- I mean it was a closet, but it was <laughs> it was organized in the closet. It wasn't like sure. they just tossed them all in a big pile there. Sure, it wasn't but a free it, kittens box. It, it, like growing up with the Noid and the raisins and yeah, and uh, you know the Mark Twain special. What is the title? What is that? What is that special that they did? Uh, it's it's gonna bug me because I remember watching that on HBO <laughs> endlessly. Um, but watching that um, and seeing those, The Adventures of Mark Twain, yeah, uh, is uh, to be able to see those actual things that you'd grown up with, and these are the real ones. Yeah, uh, was was pretty was pretty incredible. It was one of it was one of the really the the, the awesome parts of like when I worked on. Because Coraline, we would still have a little. In Coraline, we weren't in that main building that they built until, um, like the toward the end of my tenure on that film. We were really? we were we were in the tour uh, in the Pearl around twenty third. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you were, it's funny because it, it we always try to keep a super tight lid on the stuff there. Sure. But if you if you actually for a minute, if you stood in the parking lot of that building, in the Pearl and looked up, you could see directly into the offices and see the full character lineup for Coraline. Oh. <laughs> uh, and we were like, maybe you guys want to move that. Cause if you're just walking down the street, you can just see that. Not that I didn't, you know, not that anybody is, it ain't LA where like people are roaming around looking for that stuff, but. Right. Uh, right. But anyway, yeah. That's funny. Well, actually another thing that you have in common with Al, you have an Emmy. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 
yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. It's not it's not bad. I actually won that when I was on Coraline because yeah. I was because I had done um, uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends Love and got it. to work with another idol of mine, Craig McCracken, and working on that, just having a blast, and and Craig giving me an incredible amount of freedom on it. And I actually got the phone call because it was juried. So there, it wasn't even any sweat. I went to the Emmys knowing that I'd won it. Oh, sweet. Uh, b- because that category is a juried award. Gotcha. And so, so I got the call and they're they like, yeah, you won an Emmy. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> in my head was like, I was living in Portland. I was like working on this movie and they were like, yeah, you just, you just won the Emmy. And I'm like, what? He's going like, tell <laughs> What's tell that? me where, tell me when and where to be, so I go rent my tux yeah. and show up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was that was awesome uh, because it was uh, uh, Penn and Teller Sweet. Uh, were the hosts for it, and we were in the green room backstage, and I was back there, and I'm just like, like I said, I'm a shrinking violet. I'm over in the corner, and sure. there's, the ca- there's the cast of 24 back there. <laughs> And, no big deal. and um, Teller was back there, but he was talking to people and he doesn't talk, but he was oh. like talking to us. But what he was doing, he was like, Hey, does he might need a water? Does any, like, he was just, <laughs> he, again, so like, nice. like, like, like when, when people, I'm like, dude, like, like I've been a fan <laughs> of yours for way, way too long. And you're like, yeah, yeah. You want a water? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I have one. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, man. You're awesome. Wow. That's what your voice sounds like. Um, I love, I love <laughs> he and Penn Jillette so much. I love, uh, I love hearing Penn just kind of, um, I just love his philosophy on life. He's, he seems to be a very open-minded guy. And, sure. And uh, I just love hearing him talk about things. I would love to just sit down and chat with him um, uh, about stuff. And, and they're just brilliant, brilliant uh, magicians. Yeah. And, and they, like, they have such a, uh, an amazing point of view on it. I love, I love those guys. I love Ricky J. It's such a different kind of yeah. angle on, on that. But like, I also, I grew up with like Doug Henning. Right. Uh, you know, and watching Doug Henning, who, who was just a goofball, uh, but, but in, in a, in a very non cynical, charming way. So, yeah. Sure. I, there's something that you said earlier that I was thinking about that's actually pretty genius and I feel like isn't talked about a lot when you mentioned like having your art style is cool, but like when it's a job for like mm. character design and stuff, mm. you have to be able to emulate the style as is for, to fit within the realm. Cause then they're like, that character looks different than everything else here. That's yeah. You, yeah I, I think it's, um, you know, it's, I don't want to sound like the old man in the room, but I think a lot of, <laughs> I think a lot of designers now because of Instagram, you know, I'll work with designers all the time now who have way more Insta followers than I do. Mm-hmm. And, and yet when you come in, I like, I, what, what I'm expecting is, is, is you to be able, not only to be fluid in your style. I want, like, I'm hiring you for your skills, obviously. Mm-hmm. but then the other hard part about it is I need you to be able to turn a character. I need you to do all the things that are kind of production necessary. So you got to be able to turn a character. I need you to be able to do expressions. Uh, I need you to, to, to draw the character from various angles. And I think a lot of new designers coming in aren't aware that that's one of the things that they have to do. And in CG, you need to be able to work with a modeler and draw over the models so that they, you can get, I never look, I think some designers are a little bit too kind of heavy handed and, and trying to make a three dimensional thing, try to be exactly like they're drawing. And I'm like, guys are two different things. So uh-huh. I always say, whenever I give a design or a turn, this is the starting point. I, all I want, all I hope for is that it feels like this design, but that it evolves into something better, which is what you get when you work with somebody like Kent Melton. Sure. Um, he, he knows how to interpret your drawing in three dimensions that is true to it, but makes it better. And, uh, and, and you have to guide that process as a character designer in CG, you have to be able to, to supervise and, and well, not like supervise, but, but collaborate with great modelers, um, to include them in the design process and, and, and come to that perfect version of it in three dimensions. Uh, so yeah, it is, you, you do, but there will be some times when you want to hire somebody for their look, like Heidi Smith, who designed Paranorman, mm-hmm. Heidi, you hire Heidi to get Heidi. That's what you want. 
Oh. Um, you want it to look like Heidi. And sure. like, I would never say, Heidi, draw this way. I'd be like, no, Heidi, do, <laughs> do, do your thing. Cause she's amazing. Yeah. Uh, just an incredible. And she's, she works in practical media. She works in charcoal and these big drawings and, and, and very labored over beautiful drawings. Um, Carter Goodrich, Peter DeSev, like you hire those guys to draw the way that they draw. Right. Right. But then, you know, like your, your, your journeyman character designers, it, you know, we need to be like, I, I think like in a, as a designer, I think of myself as a very blue collar dude, I'm just like, Hey, you tell me what you want this to be. And we'll work together and try to find that style. Sure. And, and, you know, put the ego aside. And, and I think it's what, um, I expect of everybody that I work with in, in, and I think the director should be this way too, is, is every decision should be in support of making the film better. Um, it should all be about protecting the film. And so protecting the tone of the film, protecting the point of view of the film, every frame uh, on of animation done, every storyboard, every piece of visual development art is in service of the film. Sure. And you know, a lot of times you'll find yourself, this just happened yesterday, where there's a, there's a location in the film that I'm doing uh, that's important. And I'm working with some brilliant, uh, brilliant folks uh, on the film. And they were, when you hire brilliant people like that, they're going to be very thoughtful about it. So they were thinking about like, oh, I want this to reflect this and this, and I want this to have this and the interior is going to be like this. And I just had to say, I love this. I love all this thinking. It's great. We're going to see this location twice in the film. <laughs> so we're going to spend like a couple of weeks on this. And then I need you to focus your attention on these other things, which are much more part of the narrative of the film. Right. So we need to have a strong visual impact when we see it on screen those two times. Like it needs to really make an impact. but don't think it don't design and build all these rooms that we will never see. Cause we got to focus on that. Like you, you, you have your ABC priorities and that happens all the way down the line from, you know, the, the sequences that are being storyboarded character designs and their level of importance in the film. And especially like when you're working, like we're working again, like we're not working with the, the kind of budget that I would get at a Disney or, or, or Pixar. So we have to work smart. And, and so we just have to be very, kind of, we have to prioritize what, what we want to do and where we want to focus our attention. And, right. Um, and so you just constantly have to be, that's where I think you're, you got to have a, you got to be a little bit producer minded. Right. Um, I was just about to say that. Because what I'll say is like, look, I'm telling you this now and I don't want to kill your enthusiasm and your excitement. I just want to redirect it toward this other thing that could really use your enthusiasm and your excitement uh, because it needs it. And because I, what I don't want to do is that we spent this time on here and then I've run out of resources here. Right. So, um, yeah, it's just, you know, you want, to work. Main, you want to maintain, yeah, it is, it is, but it's fun work because, yeah, uh, especially if you surround yourself with artists who are much better than you, um, Good point. Which, if, which if you're smart, that's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, then, then the film was going to be better for it. Yeah, I, I love seeing the through line of your career as well. Because like, you started in animation, you're doing character design, and then you also get into writing, and then you get into directing and stuff. Like, how how does your brain work? <laughs> how are you so multifaceted, Shannon? Uh, I'm just I get bored easily, <laughs> and there. I'm re and I'm really stubborn. Yeah, <laughs> hey, that's how you get some of the best stuff. So I, like, I just knew, I always liked telling stories. It's just a big part of the culture that I grew up in is sitting around telling stories. Sure. And I knew I wanted, I, I knew that the best way to control my stories was to actually write them myself. Um, Smart. But I also, I also had the privilege of working with really incredible writers like Mark Ames who taught me a ton. Yeah. Um, and Mark had come, Mark had been a development executive at, on the live action side at DreamWorks for years. So not only did, does he have, not only is he an incredible writer, but he really knows how to read a room. He really, he knows um, how, to, how to hurt people, to, how, how to interpret, how to hurt people, <laughs> break their hearts, uh, how to, how to interpret a note. Yeah. Um, so I learned a lot from Mark 
and then you know one of the things because i've had people a lot of people ask me like hey how did you get into writing i'm like well i just did it yeah i just did it did it did it did it did it and then and and you have to be um i surround myself with people who will give me honest opinions when i write and i and and like everything that i write um is it like jorge gutierrez reads everything i write i read all his stuff uh uh, Peter, Mark Osborne, um, 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 uh, Makiko Akita, who's actually in production uh, on my new film. Sweet. Who, she's just, she's super smart. Um, and she's very thoughtful in her point of view when, when kind of giving a note. Um, and so like those are in John Alshima, who's my, you know, like I said, head story. He reads everything. Like those, those people and there are more who I just trust to give me an honest opinion to help me make my stuff better. And, um, and then, then the other, then the way you get to write your own stuff is if you have an idea that a studio wants to buy, Uh then your negotiating tactic is like, great, but I'm the writer. Right. Smart. Or you, or you can't have my idea. And, um, and so then you, then you, then you get to write it. Um, but I did, um, when I was coming off of doing my, my Google short, I very intentionally, when I was talking about what I was going to do after that short, we knew we were going to come back to LA and I was kind of thinking about places where I wanted to go. And I'd worked at Disney in the past, but I, I really wanted to kind of develop at Disney and, um, and my good buddy Shane Prigmore was there and he had just become an executive and he's like, yeah, we, it, we'd really love for you to come over here and we'll just let you develop. And so I knew that I was going to take that amount of time and just use it primarily for writing. Now I continued to draw throughout, like when I do a pitch, mm-hmm. I'm still drawing and doing beat boards and character designs. Sure. But I was like, I'm not only am I going to write, but I'm going to focus on writing titles where I can get meaningful samples out of. Oh, smart. And so like, I mean, it's out there. So I can talk like I was developing Haunted Mansion there. And like, yeah. you, you have a sample for a pilot that you wrote for Haunted Mansion. It's easier to get people to read that. And, um, and so I just spent, what well, I think it was about a year and a half there. And that's mostly what I did was I just wrote um, really? in the, in the benefit of having worked at Disney, what I would do sometimes because I was writing Haunted Mansion is you have your silver pass. So you can get into the parks for free. I would go and write in front of the Haunted Mansion. Oh, that's cool. So, so I would get beignets and a, and a cappuccino and my laptop and my headphones, and my music. And I would just write at Disneyland. I mean, like, what better place to write Haunted Mansion than sitting in front of the Haunted Mansion? Yeah. Um, Soak it up. So, yeah. And they, and, and that was a, I had a blast. There's other stuff that, that I did there um, that I, that I'm actually, that I may be revisiting. We'll see. We'll Ooh. see. Um, but uh, I love Disney and I love their catalog. Like, at first they were like, hey, do you want to develop your own original thing? I'm like, if I'm coming to Disney, I want to dig into your yeah. library, but I want Good to boy. do it with my take on it. So mm-hmm. let's just go in with a take and like, and, and see if we can find something there. And they, and they supported it. So I just, yeah, I spent a year and a half just mostly writing and then coming out of that, having that under my, those legs under me and then having done a, a, a lot of uh, work on the script with Mark on Kubo and, um, and then having written pilots for Cartoon Network that we produced as pilots. Um, and like just you accumulate that experience and then you just insist on being the one writing it. And then luckily I had executives who believed in me and who trusted me to do so. Sure. So, um, and I actually talk about juggling. I was actually writing the film at Sony while I was on the overall at Disney. Cause, cause I just can't not do, <laughs> and they, they were aware of it. I wasn't doing it behind anybody's back. They knew that that was part of the deal. Sure. But I just, I just like keep my brain. Uh, like I said, I get too bored. I get bored too easily. Right. So, hey, whatever works. Cause the stuff you're yeah. putting out is really, really good. Oh, thanks man. Thank do you. you really, really appreciate that. Do you have any advice then for people that are trying to get in and like doing what you're doing now that maybe they should look out for, or maybe they should like uh, really work I, on this? I would say that it's, it's, um, I was, uh, when you work at a bigger studio, especially in the feature side, it it can be very compartmentalized. 
and so they'll they'll have you doing one specific things and sometimes sometimes they'll get a, they're a little afraid to let you explore a bunch of different things but i kind of just always insisted on it sure and i was like well no i want to do story and character design or i want to do this and that and when you kind of insist on it and then you show that you can do those things you always like jorge says this all the time like bet on yourself like put the work in and let your yeah. work speak for itself and um and you but you do have to put the work in you absolutely you, even if like insta followers does not translate to success in facts film, film or tv just it doesn't um because though like the, it's a different metric people are judging you based on a, on a different thing it's not by what what kind of drawing you're painting you're putting up every day um but if you like if you really want to tell stories if that's what you want to do then you need to, you know, I'm just going to give the advice that's been, that's been given ad nauseum is you got to read a lot. You got to write a lot. You got to watch a bunch of movies. Yep. And you just do it again and again, give your, give your work to people that you trust to give you good feedback on it. And, and then just keep getting yourself out there. I can't tell you how many failed pitches I have. <laughs> um, I just, I've pitched a lot. I pitched so much to the point now where it's, I actually learned to love it. And I love the process of putting a pitch together, but I write there a full script. I, I write a full script for it. I write every word of what I'm going to do and I rehearse it. And Smart. then I, I practice it in front of people who are going to give me the same, it's usually the same people that I give my, my scripts to mm -hmm. and to get their honest feedback. Like, you know, and they'll give you feedback. Like it, this, doesn't, this doesn't sound like you, it sounds written. And then what I do is I learn it so well that I can riff on it because often in the room, when you get into the room, you're going to have people who are going to interrupt you. And right. You, you, you got to be able to roll with that. You can't be thrown by that. Sure. Um, I remember it, the the current film that I'm that I'm doing right now. When I was at Sony, and I was I was pitching to the I was pitching to the marketing team, and uh, one of the main marketing execs was getting excited. He was getting a little ahead of the pitch, and so he he interrupted to ask a question, which was totally fine. And and like I love that he was excited. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna hear my dogs bark because my family's coming home right now. That's okay. Kubo made uh, it in the last episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so he interrupted, and I said, "Look, man, I am. I, I'm. I, I love that you're so excited by this, uh, and I'm going to get to it. Your patience will be rewarded." There you go. But but it was like just so I can keep the flow of it, and he was cool about it, and and and. But you can't. And then I was able to go right back into the pitch. Sure. Um, but like I would just say, like if you want to pitch stuff and you want to tell your story. Um, and especially if you're already working in a business, never be too embarrassed to reach out to people, um, that, that, that you, that you, I mean, you don't want to cold call people if you don't know them. It's really, and you don't want to send them samples, um, that are, cause it's just, there's all kinds of legal challenges with that where, right. um, where, and it's why you'll see a lot of writers, a lot of creators who are just like, it's like, don't like, don't send me anything because I can't. I can't, I can't look at it. Um, right. It's there to protect you and it's there to protect them. Uh, but if you know somebody and you have a relationship with somebody, don't, don't hesitate to, to chat with them and kind of get their point of view. And it doesn't just mean to, to read stuff or to look at things. It's a lot of the thing, lessons I've learned is just like how to manage people. If right. You, if, you, if you're ever going to get in a position where you're going to be a supervisor of any kind, the biggest part of your job is managing other people. It's not That's doing true. the work. And I've seen a lot of times I've worked with supervisors who were brilliant artists, but they can't, they couldn't communicate with people. Mm -hmm. And, and you see it, it, it can be a frustrating process on a, on a film or a show if, if they can't communicate. Um, yeah. And so I would say like work on being clear with your direction, work on communicating clearly, work on your pitches, uh, making sure that they feel and sound professional. It feels like you've actually put and, and be prepared to ask questions, answer questions about it. And when you're pitching a show, like I often, I look back and, and like reading interviews with Vince Gilligan about uh, breaking bad and him yeah. talking about like, he knew what he wanted the show to be about, but it wasn't until I think it was the second episode where the, he made the decision to give Walter White an out uh, where where his old friends were offering him a job right and you can come here and you can work for us and we will cover your we will cover your treatments through insurance you'll have insurance and that was his way out and he chose not to take it 
because that's who he was. He was always going to become, you know, drug Lord Walter White. Right. That's just, that's just who he was. But he didn't know that until they wrote that episode or they started, they started to play on that episode in the room. And that, that wasn't, I don't think that was part of his initial pitch. I don't think he saw that coming in the pitch. He had the, so what I would say about that is there are going to be times when you've pitched something and somebody's going to ask you a, a question about it and you don't know the answer because there's still a lot, le- a lot of work left to do. Mm-hmm. Don't make something up. Just be honest and say, I don't know yet. I say it all the time. Like, I don't know yet. I tell you who, I'll tell you what I want this to feel like and what I want this character to be like. But until so we start writing episodes, I don't know yet. Right. Um, and most people will respect that. They, they, cause they understand the process. Um, it's just, and I think a lot of times, you know, when you're, when you're guiding a show or something, you, you, you have to be able to say, I don't know yet. Um, so it's so, refreshing yeah, I, honesty. For sure. yeah, it, yeah. It doesn't like, I hate when people just make something up and you can tell that they are and they don't yeah. know the answer. I'd rather them just go like, I don't know. Or I don't know. Can you help me with that? Yeah. Open the collaboration. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. It, yeah. It's making a lot of sense why you've been able to do so much cool stuff, Shannon. I'm seeing uh, Fred. I'm I'm stubborn. That's it. I'm, <laughs> I'm really stu- and I got that from both my mom and my dad. So I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> well, dude, I don't want to take up the rest of your entire day because I could talk to you for hours. This yeah, was same thing. Oh, so fun, dude. Thanks so yeah. much for hanging out. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Good man. It's so great chatting with you. But before yeah. I let you go, I gotta ask, uh, where can people find you online? Uh, they can find me on Instagram. Um, I recommend it. Name. They can find me on Twitter under my name. Um, I never could figure out Tumblr. It's yeah, so there. <laughs> uh, alien to me. Uh, so those are the two main spots where I'm most active is like Instagram and Twitter. So those, those are the places that you can find me. Love it. Love it. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.